All right. Um, I guess it's about time to sort of get started or start getting started to start or start to start to get start, start or start or something. Uh, but uh, all starting aside, uh, I want to thank the organizers. Uh, it's, this is my second time at uh, this conference. And uh, I really like it's uh, the collaboration and uh, it's a, the attitude that a good uh, presentation or good discussion leads to patches coming out, actual changes in the kernel as opposed to you know, talking about something and that you did and how wonderful it was and all that. Oh, well, that can be fun too, but uh, this feels more productive. Um, in that regard, uh, with this presentation, it's one of those very rare cases where I overachieved. That is to say, the patches landed before the talk started, but were caused by the talk. I suppose I should expect this with my memory background and everything like that. I mean, it shouldn't be too unusual. Uh, some of you may have seen them, um, and in fact, that means that this slide is obsolete. And I'd, I'd like the web page to be updated too, but I'll get in contact with Daniel or whoever it is to get that straightened out. But uh, here's the updated uh, thing, uh, a guy named Perge Mohan. Uh, he actually uh, uh, reached out to me and he figured out that the JITs for the weekly order architectures weren't doing the atomic instructions right. And so he submitted patches, some of which are on their way, way in to fix that, which is great. He also uh, updated the Linux kernel memory model itself to uh, uh, add some atomic operations, some of which BPF needs, by the way, that hadn't been added yet. Uh, in fact, they were very recently added, the capabilities very recently added to the HERD7 tool. Um, and uh, there's another thing we'll see later in the, in the presentation. But uh, anyway, I'd like a round of applause for the guy. It's, uh, he's done a huge amount of work in a, just a few days. The uh, first email I sent him uh, on this series was like one week ago, okay, and it took a while to get things going. But anyway, with that, um, so we've done some things before. Uh, I did a presentation at Linux Polish Conference on here's a memory model. I didn't really understand what people were wanting. I had an interesting discussion with Jose uh, late last year when I f they finally figured out, oh, okay, we want like BPF assembly. I was thinking of BPF the programs uh, and then uh, Alexi presented IETF, I did it at Plumbers on a informal model. Uh, okay, so we've got all this stuff. Uh, you know, what more could we want, right? Well, it'd be kind of nice to have formal definitions of tools, um, and we'd like to be able to compare against the hardware models. I mean, there's going to be bugs. Uh, Piranj found the things where the JITs weren't doing quite the right thing, and those are being fixed, but, uh, you know, these things happen. And it'd also be nice to have an official IETF standard for the memory model itself. So there's some work that needs to happen. And uh, this is reporting on progress towards that. So let's start by going through the informal model, just kind of for review to see what we're looking at here. So uh, we have BPF atomic instructions. Those, those are important. Some of those do ordering. Conditional jump instructions have a weak form of ordering. We'll take a look at that. And also load instructions in conjunction with the jump instructions and memory reference instructions, of course, if you can't have memory ordering without memory reference instructions. So the atomic instructions, we're, we're going to, have to do those in three groups. The first group is the exchange and compare exchange. Um, so a, an exchange instruction or a successful compare exchange instruction has full ordering. So you've got a compare exchange or an exchange in there, and a successful compare exchange or exchange in there, then all CPUs are going to agree that whatever happened before that atomic instruction happened before the atomic instruction itself, and that the atomic instruction happened before everything after that. Plus, we have transitivity, meaning that everything that happened before the instruction is going to be seen to happen before everything after the instruction. So it's, it's straightforward, but it's uh, really important. And there's some ways you could make that happen. Uh, this last one, just putting memory barriers before and after works, but may over-synchronize in the failure case. Now, if we, we have some atomic instructions, uh, so BPF atomic along with add, uh, or, and, and XOR, uh, if you have those and just those, that's unordered. And those are similar to atomic, add, atomic, and or, and so on in the Linux kernel. Those are also unordered. And that means that if you're doing code and you see one of those, you're free to move stuff back and forth across it, subject to whatever else other constraints might be there. All right? However, if you also have the BPF fetch flag in there, 
In other words, don't just atomically increment it, but give me the old value. All right. In that case, you're like an atomic fetch or atomic fetch add and so on in the Linux kernel, and those are fully ordered. So just a straight atomic without returning a value is unordered. An atomic that returns the old value with the BPF fetch there, in other words, that is fully ordered, just like BPF exchange is. All right? Okay. And then uh, um, we also have jump instructions. Uh, unconditional jump instructions have no ordering effects whatsoever. If you just do a branch, I mean, there may be some ordering somewhere, but the model doesn't require you to have any. However, if you're doing a conditional branch, there's some funny weak ordering that ends up being important for control dependencies, which are used in a few places in the Linux kernel and also are expected by the Linux kernel memory model. Um, and uh, that means that you gotta be a little careful, and I'll expand on this later. Um, you wanna be a little careful just how viciously you optimize once you've got the actual BPF instructions. Um, this is what I said and what Alexi said in November. Uh, it wasn't quite right. Uh, I kind of diving through the instruction level memory models uh, made me realize that I'd screwed up here. Uh, what this says is that if the, this weak ordering from the additional jumps, you have to have a load instruction, which loads a value. That value has to feed into one of the two comparison registers in the conditional branch instruction. And then there has to be a store. And that store has to be something that's within the, if you have an if statement that that branch was part of, has to be within like either the then clause or the else clause. And that's great uh, for things like LKMM or for language level because you've got these nice scoped uh, while and if and so on statements and everything's wonderful. But you know, in some language that isn't so cool. <laughs> You know, I mean, you branch and who knows where it converges or what happens. That's just a mess. So um, this is a change from uh, last November. Basically, rather than all of the stuff about control flow converging or whatever, if, if you have a load and you have additional branch and after that in, ex in program order, execution order, there's a store, there's ordering. No ifs, ands, or buts. Because the, uh, well, the, all the, all the, that matches the machine language models that exist. And again, uh, trying to take advantage of the control flow convergence. So you have a, a, a jump through a register somewhere, you've got some other stuff. Did you ever converge? Who knows? So that is a change. Okay, and this means that if you're running BPF assembly through an optimizing compiler, some care is required. Now, one thing, you know, translation's often needed and not just between different languages, but you have different groups, different mindsets. Um, and uh, this is what I said just on the previous slide. Running BPF assembly through an optimizing compiler requires some care. And uh, I can see where that might be misleading after thinking about it. Um, and Alexei Starovoidov uh, kindly provided a translation for you guys, okay? And that translation is, don't run BPF assembly through an optimizing compiler. <laughs> Uh, and thinking about it, I, I, uh, you gotta understand that part of, just part of my some care involved putting a full memory barrier before every bran conditional branch instruction, um, which might not be so good for performance. So I fully support Alexi's translation of my statement. All right, so um, uh, what this means is that uh, uh, going back there, LKML control dependencies need some love as well. Uh, uh, you, have, you can have go-to's in C, and those have the same problem that the conditional branches do in assembly, and that's something for me to worry about separately. Okay, so we want a formal memory model for this. Uh, what do we want from that memory model? Well, we like a simple hardware-based model. We've proven ourselves we need something related to the hardware. Uh, we need to be consistent with the Linux kernel memory model or running in the context of the Linux kernel, so that's, that's the governing thing there, those are the rules. And that means we'd like to, we prefer to avoid forbidding reorderings that Linux kernel memory model allows. Now that's not fatal if we don't do that. Uh, for example, LKMM allows loads to be reordered. x86 doesn't do that. And that's okay, all right? Um, so in some cases it'll be all right, but we want to be careful. We also, in particular, we want to be able to map to supported hardware without much overhead. So for example, 
Um, if we weren't careful, we, would we might find that we need to put extra memory barriers around traditional branches when mapping to ARMv8 or PowerPC, and that's not something we want. So we want to choose the memory model such that we can just map directly the machine instructions on those architectures and get what we're expecting. All right? So we want to be weak enough that we aren't killing ourselves going to the weekly order architectures that are in, in use and exist to run BPF. That makes sense? Okay. And uh, of course, it's really important. Uh, I suspect that the current IETF standard for the BPF instruction set will someday be obsolete. New instructions will be added and things like that. And we'd like the memory model to have a decent chance of accommodating that. Okay. So. We already have this uh, Linux kernel memory model. Um, it's formally there. It's in HERD7 and various other places. It defines the limits of weakness. You don't want to be weaker in the instruction set than the memory model is. So ask the guys that do alpha if you don't believe me. Um, and uh, there's some additional functionality might be excluded. So, um, and we'll look at a way of doing that. And so the idea, one thing you could do is you could just take BPF assembly language and just map it into C code and run that through the C language uh, Linux kernel memory model. That'd be one, one thing you could do. Uh, you want to exclude the stuff that BPF can't do. That turns out to be pretty simple. There's a big long file. That's all that's left after, after, after you do the exclusion. Uh, this is uh, Linux kernel.defs. Um, and you can use that with the rest of the files, no problem. Um, so all we do is delete some lines. What's not to like? And it would be nice if it was that easy, but, uh, well, the problem is that the high-level languages in the assembly have different event structures in the formal verification tools. We have to deal with that. And uh, uh, there's some odd constraints that assembly always has. Uh, in BPF, R0 is special in the compare exchange instruction. You need an extra register, that's where you get it from. And also the bit about uh, converting branches in if while can be a little bit obnoxious. So we really want a hardware memory model. And uh, LKMM is still useful. Uh, that's something we can compare against. If we, do, if we end up um, allowing something that LKMM forbids, that's a bug and we need to fix it. Or vice versa, the case may be. Okay, so what hardware model should we use? We want to start, it's best to start for something real. I and mean, we could just make up one, but um, that isn't necessarily a strategy to win. And we got some choices. x86 is too strong. It orders loads against prior loads, stores against prior stores, uh, prior loads against later stores. Uh, and if you say that's our memory model, and then you try to JIT into a PowerPC or an ARM V8, you're going to have a lot of memory barriers you're emitting to make up the difference. And that's not going to be fun. We don't want that. PowerPC is actually a nice, fairly clean memory model. It's fairly simple, uh, but it's not really being actively developed anymore. And plus, it has, it, it has something that's kind of cool. It has load link and store conditional, which, you know, coming back from when I got into concurrency, that was, that was a really cool stuff back then. But, uh, and that's what ARM started with, except that they've added real atomic instructions, which should indicate that there's some shortcomings there. BPF has the real atomic instructions, and PowerPC doesn't really directly provide those. It, it has sequences of instructions that get you an effective at atomicity. And so that means that if we just try to take the PowerPC model, we're going to have to do a lot of damage to it to get the atomic instructions jammed into it. We don't want that either. So, well, uh, if, if you go down the list of the ones that are actually in use today, right, RISC-V you could imagine, but um, I don't think it's really there in terms of people really hammering on concurrency really hard on that platform. Uh, so that leaves you ARMv8. And uh, here's some advantage disadvantages. Uh, advantages in green, then yellow and red. Um, it's actually developed and maintained. There's a lot of people working on it and a bunch of uh, kind of a board that keeps track of it. It's well designed uh, once you understand it. Uh, we'll go through some cases where that's not trivial. It's fully featured. It's got a lot of stuff, and that's a good thing. Uh, one bad thing is it has a whole bunch of stuff we don't need. All right? A whole bunch of it. It's actually, they've done some really cool stuff. We'll take a look at it later. but. Um, you know, there's a bunch of things that BPF doesn't, uh, assembly doesn't do and probably won't ever do. It's also stronger than PowerPC and 32-bit ARM, uh, which is a little bit of a problem, and we'll have to adjust for that. Uh, because, again, we don't want to, if we're, if we're going to JIT to ARM or to 32-bit ARM or PowerPC, we don't have to want to throw memory barrier instructions every time we turn around. 
But this is worth looking into. This might be a good starting point. OK, so the ARM V8 memory model. Um, let's see if I can actually get the manual dexterity together and uh, coordination to show it to you. So let's see. Let's, let's see here. Uh, so we do that. And then we go over here and we do that. And then we do that. Yeah, uh, of course you can't read that. So let's uh, do that. Okay, now you still can't read it, but that's okay. We're not going to read this line by line. For one thing, there's 31 pages of it. We're just going to go through it quickly and uh, look at uh, uh, kind of the pieces of it. So we got some basic definitions. A lot of these are pretty straightforward. Um, they've got uh, uh, things like tag memory effects or examples of features that ARM has of tag memory uh, to allow checking use after free, which BPF doesn't have. Maybe it will someday, but we can ignore that. Context synchronization effects. We, aren't, we don't do memory mapping in BPF. There's not a BPF MMU we use, so we'll be able to ignore that. Uh, more stuff we're going along. Let's see, uh, uh, more tagging, more TLBs. Uh, hardware update successor, uh, um, they actually, uh, there's some stuff in here. I, I haven't talked to them about it, but there's some stuff in here. It looks like they're trying to actually model uncached accesses, MMIO accesses, as if they might actually produce models of popular devices and maybe be able to verify the firmware, the driver, and the device registers all together, which would be really cool if that's, I mean, they're starting in that direction. Maybe they'll actually do that, I don't know. That'd be really cool, but that's not what we're using BFPA for. Um, and then there's a bunch of relations, um, dependencies, and uh, uh, more dependencies and ordering. And then we have the external stuff. At this point, we're getting to stuff that we really don't care about, so I'll stop there. But that gets you give you an idea of what we're what we're looking at, what we're starting from. No, oh, I didn't uh, full screen it, so I don't need to unfull screen it. I might need to do that and then move it back over here. Okay, so that's that's where we're starting from. It's something that's kind of large, which is a little bit of a disadvantage. On the other hand, it's complete and it's as I said, it's it's uh, being actively maintained. Okay. Um, what I, I'm not going to drag you through all of that. Um, yeah, we don't have time and. Uh, uh, I don't think any of us have the energy for it. What I'm going to do instead is look at a couple of examples that kind of hit me over the head really hard. Um, and hopefully there'll be some entertainment value of that, out of that and also give you some idea of what kind of things we're looking for when we do this. So um, you may have caught dependency ordered by, as it, uh, dependency ordered before as it went flying by the screen there as I paged through it. Uh, let's take a look at it. I'm going to read this just, just because, all right? Dependency order before. A dependency creates an externally visible order between a read memory effect and another memory effect generated by the same observer. Same observer is like same CPU. A read memory effect R1 is dependency order before a read or write memory effect RW2 from the same observer if R1 appears in program order before RW2 and any of the following cases apply. Now, the other cases were pretty straightforward. I didn't have to worry about this one got my attention. RW2 is a write memory effect W2 that appears in program order after an explicit read or write memory effect RW3, and there's address dependency from R1 to RW3. Okay, you guys all got that? I'll give you a test in five minutes. You'll be able to rattle it right off. I, I didn't get it in five minutes either. <laughs> uh, how many people would prefer something like a C code or a diagram rather than this? Yeah, uh, me too. Okay, so let's, uh, let's uh, take a look here. Here's a diagram, okay? So we got this uh, read R1. This is the initial read, and we have a read or write RW3, and, there's, and the thing about this read R1 is it, figure, it has control of the address that that read or write goes to. So, you know, this might be picking up an array index, and this might be an array access. Then we've got unrelated write W2 that goes somewhere else entirely. Okay, so there's no real, I mean, it, it could well be that the write W2 has a constant address that's known at compile time, or at least link time. All right, and ARM V8, when we read that, says that despite the fact that that write is totally unrelated, it says that there's ordering here between that read and that final write. And of course, uh, PowerPC famously reorders writes all over the place, and so I figured I'd better dig into this one and really understand it, make sure to see, do I include this in the model, don't I? What's, what's going on here? Okay. 
So here's a, if you prefer Linux kernel C code, here's an equivalent to it. We might have an RCU reference that picks up a, a pointer to an array. Okay, so we got a whole pile of RCU point, uh, protected arrays out there. We pick up, we get one of them. And then we write a value into, we, we get an I index from somewhere, who knows where. But we're going to take that RCU protected array, we're going to write into one of the index, we'll write the value 42. Okay, so we've got a read that affects the address written to by that write. So that's part of the thing we've got there. And then we've got an unrelated write. Write wants X. This is a test. They aren't even the same type. No relation whatsoever. Yet, if we read, at least if I read that wording correctly, ARM V8 is going to order that first read against that second write. And, okay, uh, does PowerPC do it? If PowerPC doesn't do that, I don't want that in the memory model. Okay, because we want to be able to generate, we want to jit to PowerPC without having to kill ourselves. All right, well, you know, this seems like a question for memory model to me. And uh, fortunately, PowerPC has an executable memory model. You can write little snippets of code and run it through it and have it tell you what happens. Um, but you, you can't just give it this because there's nothing to order against. You just got these things, all right? Uh, so you have to have some test code to be able to check the order. And one way to do that would be, would be to drop some stuff on the floor. Apologies. Uh, hopefully the slide advancer still works. I, I'm sorry. I'm not sure how I managed to knock that off, but I did. Got to have a talent, right? And that's mine. Um, all right. So we've got our initial thing we had up there. So we have the read. We have the second read or write whose address is affected by the first read. And then we've got an unrelated write. And so we're going to have another CPU do some things to check that, to see what the ordering is. So we're going to read first, and we wanna, we're going to read from the same thing written by that write. Okay, we, we might, or not, might not get the value. The arrow indicates the case where we do get the value, but we might or might not. Then we're going to have a full barrier, SMPMB inside the Linux kernel, or the sync instruction for PowerPC. And then we're going to write to the same location that read looks at. And th this again shows the read getting that write. And what ARM says is you don't get a circle out of that. You can't, you know, you can't have uh, that read happen, that write happen, that write happen, this read read the value written, the full barrier of this write, and this read here having read the, in, that value written over there. It says, no, don't do that, uh, which is a fine thing to not do, but if PowerPC can do that, we need to know that. Um, so this is a litmus test. Um, it looks a little bit ugly, but life's like that. The PPC up in the very upper corner says this is PowerPC. The next thing is just this name. We have initialization, which is a little bit of a weird syntax. The zero colons on that first line say process zero. Process zero here, that's like C the first CPU. Okay, so the zero colon R2 equals X says that process zero's R2 register is initialized to the address of X. All right? And then the ones do the same thing for process one. And just to make it, e make it simpler and to avoid uh, uh, I've gotten myself in trouble by not being consistent, okay? Uh, R2 is always X, R4 is always Y, and R, R6 is always Z. All right, so uh, we could have initialized register R1 if we wanted to, but since it's a constant, it's easy to just use load immediate instruction, which is what happens here. We put a 1 in R1. We load R2 is X into R3. And then uh, we take R3 exclusive or with itself, which gives us 0. We put it in R5. We add R5 to R4. R4 was Y. It's still Y. But because we did that, the harbor is going to track a dependency from this instruction to this store because we take R4 and store R1, which is 1, into it, R4 being Y. All right? Uh, because we, we loaded something, we did a series of arithmetic operations, and then we used that as the address to store, um, both ARM and PowerPC are going to say, yep, okay, there is a dependency from this load to this store is an address dependency, and we're going to keep that thing ordered. And then we've got our store here to Z, uh, R6 is Z, which has nothing to do with any of this stuff, so maybe it gets reordered beforehand. Um, and then P1 just straight, it loads R1 into as 1. It loads Z into R3. It does a sync, which is SMBMB, essentially, full memory barrier. 
and then it stores the one again into x. Okay, so uh, this exist clause says if 0r3 is 1, in other words, this load got the value this thing stored, and this says 1 colon r3 equals 1, okay, 1 is process 1, r3 is right there, this load got the value this thing stored, let me know about it, tell me about it, okay, exist says, did this happen? Uh, normally, uh, we put bug in the exist, so it's kind of like an assert not or a warn on, but you know, herd is, uh, doesn't care, you can put whatever you want there, it's just going to check to see if it happens. It, it doesn't judge. But in this case, it, it, this would be, and we're just asking, can this happen? It's not really a bug or, or not a bug. And what you do is you say herd 7, you give it the name of the file, and it spits this stuff out. The key thing is, is says, it says never. And what that means is that PowerPC is not allowed to, to misorder that. Which means that ARM V8's memory model in this aspect of it is just fine for PowerPC too. PowerPC has that same restriction. Okay, well that's convenient. It means we can pass that through perhaps. Um, it orders it. Um, but why not check the Linux kernel memory model as well? Just, just because, right? As long as we're thinking about it. So this is a, it says C up there, and it's got the name of it again. Uh, and that means it's a C language style thing, so it looks differently. We've got the initialization just as we before. X equals Y sounds, looks kind of weird. What it really means, if you think of it as X equals ampersand Y, you'll be better off. It says take the address of Y and put it in X. Now these things take parameters. The parameters are the global variables. You can initialize them, you don't have to. If you don't initialize them, they're zero. Um, so we've got u, x, y, and z as our, as our variables. We take x and we read it. We put that in R1. We write through the address red. So initially, if, we, if, if this thing was the first thing to execute, we'd pick up the address of y, we'd put it in R1. We'd indirect through that, so we'd be storing 1 into y. And then we would be storing 1 into z. And on the other side, uh, we would uh, load from Z, we would have a memory barrier, and we'd store the address of U into X. All right? So again, you need to pretend there's an ampersand in front of that U. It's a little bit confusing. Uh, and then the, the exist clause says, is, did R1, 0 R1, so 0 colon R1, that's P0's R1, did that end up being the address of U? In other words, that store, the value stored by that store got loaded here, and um, 1R1 is 1. In other words, this store got loaded up there. Okay? And so it's, it's the same exist clause we saw for PowerPC and, uh, and uh, for ARM. And it's the same example, just different language. So let's have some votes here. Of course, I'm probably telling, you know, uh, how many people think that Linux kernel memory model says it's just fine to have that outcome? Okay, we got a couple of them. Uh, some of you, want, some are more aggressive than others. How many people think that uh, LKMM will be like if you see an ARM and, and forbid it? We got a lot of inside people here. Must be an election year or something. Okay, um, in fact, uh, Alexi and Dave were right. Uh, it says sometimes. And at this point, it's kind of worth thinking, okay, well, what's happening here? Why is this happening? Elkima does not order this, and uh, because, you know, should BPF assembly order it or shouldn't it? We clearly have the latitude to go either way. What should we do? So let's take a look. The, this is what's happening here. So again, we loaded a value. We indirected through it. So this load governed the address of this store, and this store was independent. All right. So why? Why do PowerPC and ARM order this thing where, where you've got the totally independent stores and the load having nothing to do with the second store. Why do they order it? Yeah. Uh, so uh, some constraint on flushing write buffers. That's, that's a good guess. Write buffers are uh, the source of many evils in memory ordering, I'll give you that. But uh, not quite. Other guesses? Yeah. 
All right. Is it aliasing? You got it. Exactly. Exactly. See, the thing is, uh, the thing is that both of these CPU families, in fact, all CPU families uh, that the Linux kernel currently supports, say that if you have a whole bunch of CPUs and they're accessing just one, uh, one location, those accesses are going to be ordered. There's going to be at least one single global order that is consistent with all the loads and all the stores. Okay, so that means that you've got this load and it determines the address of the store. Well, you can't tell whether that store aliases the following store until that load completes. And we could tell just by looking at it, but the hardware can't tell until it actually gets to that point. And therefore, the hardware had to wait until the load completed before it could allow that second load, to, that second store to complete. Okay. So uh, LQM <laughs> didn't order them. What the heck, right? Why, why, why doesn't it have the same constraint? And the answer is that uh, uh, LKMM is kind of a crystal ball thing. It kind of knows, right? It, it knows the values. So it knows before the load happens what the load's going to do. And therefore, it can, it can let the stores happen first. Uh, and that's uh, one of the interesting side effects of, of this uh, constraint-based system that uh, HERD7 is, and all the things that act like full state, uh, uh, full state search things. If you have an execution-based one, it wouldn't necessarily do that. But uh, HERD7 is, uh, is a constraint solver, and therefore it says, nothing says I can't do that, so I will. Okay, now, the thing is, BPF doesn't have the prior knowledge. So in my opinion, it should follow PowerPC and ARM and forbid that, just because otherwise it's a bit crazy for actual physical hardware. Yeah, anyway, okay, so... Um, uh, the another one, that was one example of one that kind of caught my attention. The other one was this thing called hazard order before. Uh, just the name, but also doing it. And I'll read through this again. An effect E1 is hazard order before and effect E2 if all of the following apply. E1 is an explicit read memory effect R1. Uh, Paul, can I interrupt for a second? Like before you go to the next uh, example, can you go back like a couple slides before? Sure. Tell me when to stop. Uh, yeah. So like the, yeah. Put the red stuff. More? Oh. No, 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 the, there? The, the, okay. the, the, your, your proposal. So okay. it makes sense, like, to me. And I think this example, like, clearly, like, illustrates the um, translation uh, that I was giving and your, that JITs need to care. So now, like, imagine yourself in a JIT shoes that needs to understand this. But JITs, like if it is like a smart compiler, compiler will actually have this knowledge. Compiler will actually think that, well, there are different locations, so why not? So it will actually act as LKM, as Linux kernel memory model because, as you're saying, it knows the full execution and will just reorder them. And whether it's like safe or not, then it will depend because like compiler will act as LKML, whereas like BPF memory model will act, will act as a hardware. So if you wanted to make it work, you would have to like put a barrier after every freaking load, or between every load and anything that he's doing. Yeah, I'm saying, I'm saying if JIT like so, would, would uh, follow, so would I, follow I fully, this. I totally support your don't do this. Yeah, I'm just saying that like if JIT would follow this recommendation, it would, well, it would be very interesting JIT. <laughs> so uh, so your, your argument is uh, that we should go with this way or not? No, the, the, the proposal that it should follow like PowerPC and ARMv8 like makes sense because that's what okay. the hardware would do and that's how we probably should document it. But it means that it's even stronger reason not to do any smart quote quote stuff in JITs. Okay, I fully support that. All right, so we got uh, through dependencies. Let's look at some hazards. All right, so uh, I'm going to start over here just, uh, just to be pedantic. We have an effect E1, hazard order before, and effect E2 if all of the following apply. E1 is an explicit mean read memory effect R1. What's explicit? An implicit memory effect is one that involves transition look aside buffers marking accessed and modified things in, in page tables, tape, uh, TLB entries. So read memory effects, all we care about it. 
R1 appears in program order before an explicit read memory effect R3. R1 and R3 access the same location. R1 and R2 are from different observers. Different observers. R3 is coherence before E2, and E2 is an explicit write memory effect W2. And I don't know about you guys, but I need a diagram. There we are. Now, we have our read R1. We read the same location, that's R3, on the same CPU. And uh, on some other CPU, we write that same thing. And the write comes after the read. In other words, that reread there gets the old value that that write overwrote. Okay? And the question, and this was kind of like, what? Is, okay, well, does the first read come before the write? And of course, the thing about all the accesses to a single location being ordered is kind of like, well, how can it do anything else? But they saw fit to put that wording in there, so you know, you have to dig a little bit deeper. Okay, so um, here's what it would look like in code. Uh, we have thread zero does a read once of x, and then another read once of x. It's pretty straightforward. And thread one does a write once of x to one. And uh, we know, based on the conditions, I mean, the, the way the wording said, that we know that R2 came out zero. Uh, and, the, and the thing it says is that the load into R1 has to also come before that write. So what the heck can that mean? All right? Well, clearly, it can't mean that the value of R1 is, either, is one. We know that can't happen because of the coherence order requirements of all the hardware. So the only thing that can possibly be is that ordering based on this somehow uh, gets confused, all right? So what we have to do, okay, so we're gonna go and show the thing again. I'm moving it around. The reason I'm moving it around, I mean, so I, I had a perfectly good diagram before and this one looks really weird. We got coherence arrows pointing backwards. What the heck, Paul? Uh, the reason for that is that to, we're gonna have to put some extra code in here to check the ordering. And in this case, that code has to be before the read and after the write. Okay, because that's the way the ordering's going. Uh, okay, so, um, I mean, we need something really lightweight. We're looking at something that's really kind of feathery in terms of what ordering it's doing. So we need something really at light rate and, um, you know, uh, a release store and a acquire load is pretty lightweight. So what we might do is we might say, well, okay, we know that that read's gonna get zero, uh, but is there some other ordering? based off of those things. So we do the write, then we do a release write. And up here, we do an acquire read of that write, and then let's other stuff happen. Okay, and then um, if that can form a cycle, then that would be something where that wording in the ARM manuals was trying to prevent. Can anybody see a problem with this strategy? So the problem, that release and that acquire are gonna fully synchronize this thing. Just by adding the test code, we've synchronized any misordering that might be out of existence. That doesn't work. It's too heavyweight. And because it's too heavyweight, um, the test code, you know, <laughs> you can't tell anything from it. And we need a little help from a litmus test called R. What we're gonna do is we're gonna reduce the synchronization by using heavyweight operations. The, okay, we're gonna actually make the synchronization heavier weight and be able to sense a lighter weight misordering. That may sound strange, but that's let me test R for you. What we're gonna do, we're gonna put a full barrier in there. We're not gonna mess around, we'll put a full barrier. So we're gonna do a write, full barrier, so that writes two. A read, another read, and then we have this read doing the same value. Um, again, this, if this wrote one, both those reads are gonna give us back zero. And then after that, we're gonna do a release write, like we did before, um, and we're gonna write one. So we're substituting an acquire load for its full barrier. How does that make things lighter weight? Can anybody tell me what, what trick is happening here?
So what's happening, it's, it's, it's uh, the thing is, one of the problems with uh, nice abstractions and computer science-y things, I mean, they're very powerful, don't get me wrong, there's been a lot of progress from them. But uh, they sometimes run afoul of something called the laws of physics. And before we had a read and then a write, and the question was, did that read pick up what was written? That requires information to be physically transferred through the machine. And that is subject to speed of light delays. And so just the write and the read give us physics-generated uh, heavy synchronization. In this case, we got two writes. And uh, David called out store buffers before, and you got that, that's the right answer to this one. Uh, the thing is, the system could do the writes, and sometime quite a bit later, figure out what, writes, what order it wants those writes to have been in because of the store buffers. They kind of both go in the store buffers, and the cache line kind of runs around and picks them up in some order that you don't know until microseconds later. So that means that, yeah, there's heavier, ordering, heavier weight ordering between that write and that read, but there is no ordering between that write and that write, or very, very, very weak ordering between them. Yeah, quick, go ahead. Quick question. Uh, why not uh, write, why store uh, release as well? Why extra barrier? Just replace the breed acquire with both will be just write release. Uh, why not make this write a release? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. You could, but there's nothing in front of it, so it wouldn't matter. Yeah, but like that will be the same purpose, right? Um, same effect, I mean, as uh, this two. Uh, you would... Well, you would make the write instruction a little bit heavier weight uh, in terms of execution, but it wouldn't affect the, uh, the, the memory ordering, the, the flow yeah. of the data through the machine. I, I think I'm missing your point. Help me out here. I mean, well, I don't know. Like, just like, to me, this extra like, memory barrier, like, it's only like, confusing. So Because you only ordered the oh, oh, okay. program order in both so, CPUs, and if both of them are writes, that's, okay, you, you so get me, the same let me, effect. Let me no? try again. Let me see if I understand you. So you're saying, I got this SMP and B, that's heavyweight. Can I make this be a write release and get rid of the SMP and B? Is that, yes. is that the question? Okay, and unfortunately the answer is no. The reason is, is that if this is, a, if this is a write release, it's only gonna order that write against anything before it, of which there's nothing. Similarly, if you make that a read acquire, that's only gonna order things after it, which is not this write. Ah, got it. Okay, but uh, uh, one thing you could do, uh, no, you can't even, yeah, you have to have a full barrier to make the write come for the read. But yeah, it's a uh, nice try. I, I appreciate, the, I appreciate the, thought, the work there. Okay, so if we do PowerPC again, same sort of thing. We've got X and Y and R2 and R4, respectively. We're going to load a 2 into R1 in this case, because that's what we're storing on the one side. We store 2 into X. We do an S of PMB, a full sync instruction. Then we load from Y into R3, and we load again with no additional ordering from R4, from X, excuse, from Y into R5. So let me try that again, because I wasn't doing very well. We take two and we store it into X. We do a full memory barrier. We load from Y into R3, we load again from Y into R5. On the other side, we make ourselves a one in R1. We store that into Y. We do a, an LW sync followed by a store is PowerPC store release. Okay? So we do an LW sync and then we store that same one into X. All right? And the question is at the end, did we get back zeros for R3 and R5? So 0 R3 is that 0, 0 R5 is that 0? Because if this gets 0, that means it came before that store in some weak sense. And then is the final value of X R2? If this guy stored 1 to x, this guy stored 2 to x, and so if the final value of x is 2, that means in some weird sense, this store happened before that store, and that gives us our cycle through the whole thing. All right. So, uh, any, any guesses as to whether this can happen on PowerPC or not? Don't feel bad. Uh, this litmus test is, is, is just insane. It's, uh, everybody, that's hit, everybody I know, including myself, that's hit it the first time has had uh, severe brain cramps for quite some time. All right? Uh, it's a very weird one. And the answer is, it can happen on PowerPC. And think about that a bit. We had a full memory barrier on one side, 
and we had a thing that orders writes on the other side of two writes, and it still managed to tangle it up. How does that happen, right? Well, it does happen, and it can be observed on real hardware. So um, the thing is, as I mentioned before, but I'll push it back in, if you have writes like that, where you have a write of one value, write of other value, and you look at the final value to figure out which write happened first, um, that isn't telling you anything about when the writes actually happen in, in global time. Because the writes go into the store buffer, and the system figures out maybe long afterwards, and just says, oh, I'm gonna pick that one as being the first one. Which may or may not be consistent with the time at which the software did the store. Now, um, PowerPC has a charming feature where different CPUs can see different stores in different orders. They can disagree on the order of stores. Okay. And uh, that's known as, uh, and, and ARM V8, uh, ARM, the old ARM, 32-bit ARM, has that same property. Uh, the rumor I heard was that Richard Grissomthwaite uh, took a look in, when he first got multiprocessor ARMs and he saw that PowerPC had the best defined architecture for memory order, so he went with that one. Um, and uh, later on, when they went to ARMv8, they decided that uh, this bit about the, the CPU seeing stores in different orders was causing way more confusion than was helping uh, make the hardware fast. And so they have something called other multi-copy atomicity, which is um, a strange term, uh, which says that if you have two CPUs, that aren't doing any of the stores, they will agree on the order that all of those stores that they didn't do happened in. The only way a CPU can disagree with some other CPU about the order of a store is if one of those CPUs actually did the store in question. And that brings the weak ordering much more in tune with people's intuitions, although not that much more. Um, and this is an example test where that matters. Um, Again, this is, like I said, everybody that's first hit this litmus test has had some severe mental indigestion. Um, I have a section of my book where it just goes through. There's a tool where you can kind of go step by step through PowerPC's memory model, and that section kind of leads you through that. And if you're serious about understanding this, which uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure you should be, but if you are, uh, you can go through that and it'll be very helpful. And the book, the URL at the bottom, the slides will be posted somewhere at some point. Okay, uh, so PowerPC really can make this happen, but I might have misread that passage from the memory model thing. So a good question is, well, can ARMv8 make this happen? So we got the same litmus test, but an ARMv8 assembly, assembly code. I'm not gonna go through it again, and it cannot happen. So that gives me at least some reason to believe that I actually understood that piece of the memory model, and it's important, and we don't want it in VPF because we don't want to have to have random extra strong things if we're generating jet, if we're jitting for PowerPC. At least last I knew, we care strongly about PowerPC. Okay, Alexi's smiling and nodding, so I'll. Okay, and uh, uh, so that's, so BPF uh, doesn't do weak barriers, so this particular, you can't do this litmus test in BPF assembly code because there's no store release and there's no weak barrier. So in BPF assembly, you'd have a full barrier on both sides and that would be forbidden anyway. So, but um, I've heard rumors that BPF might want a store release at some point, so we should be thinking in terms of the future and worry about it now anyway. Okay. Um, I was hoping that I could really simplify things because BPF does not have a, compare, a conditional move instruction. However, the ARM guys are really clever about, uh, they, they, it turns out there's similar effects you get out of compare and exchange. And they very carefully put those together and use the same wording for all of them, so I just, <laughs> I just pull these little bits off the side. Hey, you can't have everything. It took me a while to figure that out. Um, avoiding the other multi-copy atomicity uh, simplifies things intuitively, but in very complicated ways. I'm not 100% sure I've quite figured out exactly which parts of the ARM memory model are there to say you will be other multi-copy atomic. I think I've rooted them all out. There might be some more. I'll have to root them out further. Uh, there's a whole pile of stuff that ARM does. I mean, it's really impressive. I mean, they, they model the MMU. They model translation look aside buffers in their memory model, okay? You can model self-modifying code in their memory model. Cache management instructions, they got those too in there. 
MMIO access is at least sort of the beginnings of it. They have things called shareability domains where different, where you can have synchronization that does not go across the whole system but just across one NUMA node. They do that. They model it. Uh, and, and vector instructions, which are even weaker than normal instructions, and they got that in the model too. So weak barriers and weak leader instructions, uh, which BPF does not yet have, will add some complexity, and I think we need to look ahead for that. And uh, the, as I said before, conversion control, control flow in an assignment language doesn't make any sense. Um, and I apologize for having misled people with that earlier. Okay, now one question you might have at this point is I've gone through a whole bunch of litmus tests and there's no BPF assembly language and this is a BPF memory model, right? I mean, what's the deal here? Well, there's some BPF assembly language. And uh, it's a, it says BPF at the top saying this is BPF, which allows HERD7 to automatically pick the right stuff out and do the right things with it, uh, almost. We'll get into that a bit. And uh, uh, we have the same sort of thing with initializing stuff. And I'm not going to go through this in great detail, uh, well, but, but this, is a, this is a SOAR instruction, BPF SOAR instruction. This is an atomic instruction whose only purpose is to provide full ordering. It doesn't actually do anything aside from provide the ordering semantics because it returns the value. This does another store. Uh, so this stores uh, 2 into X, this stores 0 into Y. The other side we pick up, uh, we pick up Y and we store that value into X. So there's a data dependency on that side, and there's full barrier on this side, okay? And uh, both, uh, this isn't R. I mean, each, each, the key thing is that in both sides, we're reading something the other side wrote. And when you've got that property, things get a lot simpler, and you can just count on ordering. R is weird because you don't have that, you have writes going to writes. So we'd hope that this would be ordered by uh, Perrin J's initial prototype memory model. And in fact it is. That misordering can never happen. So, and that was, there, there really is a herd piece on, in uh, Perrin J's GitHub archive that does this and we really ran that and it got out. Um, so we have partial syntax for, for syntax and um, uh, he, what he did was, he, he, I've been messing with RMV8, he started with LKMM. And uh, I actually hope that we use his eventually because it's simpler, but we need to go through and see what happens. And there's some URLs if you want to play with it. You can pull uh, herd, herd tools down from there. You can build it. And there's a bunch of litmus tests that you can find and run through it if you want. What's next? Well, uh, this is our goals again. Um, we don't yet have the branch ordering, uh, or I should say Perenje does not yet have that in there, but. On the other hand, uh, Thursday last week, there was no model at all, so it might happen pretty quickly. Uh, that, by the way, is why he's, I want to add him to the author list. He did an incredible amount of really complicated work really quickly. I was, I'm quite impressed with him. Um, now, uh, uh, we got a poll here. So um, I believe that what we saw there was kind of like the hardware mnemonics. Correct me if I'm wrong. Are those, am I giving it the wrong name? I'll, I'll go up and show you what we had again. So that's, that's the mnemonics we have. So that's one style. Clang has a style, and GCC has a style. I think this is neither GCC nor Clang. Right? That would be so this is, with this my is <coughs> kernel. This is the assembly syntax. OK. And that's probably fine. So, uh, which, uh, so what I want to do is I want to say, I, uh, I, I let Perenje know that he might have to change. OK, but on the other hand, I didn't want to slow him down, right? Um, so this is this is what Paranje picked. Yeah, this is what he picked. Yeah, looks fine. Okay, uh, but uh, so if he just does that and that's all you have, that's good. I think so. <laughs> is it is this what uh, Godbolt will generate? This is what is this? Will Godbolt, if you handed a if you handed a, a piece of C code and tell it to to, uh, to generate BPF instructions, which you can do, I will it do that? I'm pretty sure Clang, uh, like this is this, well, maybe there are bugs, but both like BPF verifier is supposed to disassem like this, and okay. Clang BPF backend is supposed to emit the same stuff, including like all the M OBJ dump. Okay. We're supposed to print the same stuff, but. Okay, so it sounds like this is good for now. Yep. If, it turn, if, it, if it turns out this is problematic and we need to change, let me and know I sooner think, like, I think GCC also does the same, no? Yeah, so. 
Okay. Anyway, the, the, the key thing is we want, we want users to be able to uh, uh, easily generate litmus tests. And uh, writing assembly language, uh, I mean, uh, us old guys, you know, are proud of being, of being able to do it. But even I will use Godbolt <laughs> as a cheat. So it'd be good if that worked. Okay, great. So it looks like what we have might be good. And we'll, if, again, if that's a, a problem, uh, let us know. Uh, Pernji is working on, on HERD7. And uh, Hernan Luis de Soto is working on uh, something called D'Artagnan. Uh, with some luck, in a little while, we'll have not just one, but two tools able to do this. Uh, we're, I put them together so that they have, I, I, we need the same litmus test to go into both tools verbatim, okay? That's, for me, that's a hard requirement. Um, there's a lot of validation, let's light on that. And uh, uh, the for, exact form of standard text is something we're working on. I've got a, I've got a prototype based on ARMv8. Uh, we're getting short on time, so I'm not going to show it to you, but I'll throw it to the individuals if you want. Uh, we started on the litmus tests in the Linux kernel uh, memory model, uh, basically translate them to, uh, Perm has been translating them to BPF assembly language and then running them. And then there's uh, a test6bot.pdx is a really cool three-page PDF that shows PowerPC mnemonics and how they're supposed to go. Um, and that is uh, really useful and so we'd have to do that. We need, there's a whole, there's a GitHub litmus test archive and that'll need to be checked. And then also, uh, we found some bugs in the JITs, and so we'll need some way of validating JITs based on this, and that's TBD. Anybody like to see a demo? All right, we got, we got a few hands. I'll give it a shot here. Let's see if I can get away with this. So I do that. Wow. And then I do, and then I make my fingers work, maybe. And then I do that. And then I do that. And then I do, okay, it already, um, this is probably not visible, I would guess. Can people in the back read that? Okay. Uh, okay, so maybe cranking it up a little bit would be good. Let me get my act together here. Nope, come on, Paul. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do that. And I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. Is that better? Okay, well, let's crank it down some more. It's fine. We can, get, we can go quite a bit smaller if I can make my fingers work anyway. In theory, we can get smaller. Is that better? <laughs> hey, wait a minute. I don't like this. You know, that's not doing anything for me. Okay, what I'm going to do... Say again. Normally what I do is control right click and I get a choice of font. <laughs> but maybe we can, your mouse is over there already, or was. Control shift plus. This is the next term, but who knows. Okay. Oh, that's, yeah, that's, uh, oh, that'll just make it bigger or smaller like I did. Let's, let's, let's try their suggestion here. Control shift plus. Let's uh, do that and that. And then, uh, no, it doesn't like that very well. Now it works. It is? Okay. <laughs> Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, people in back, you can always walk forward when we take a look, all right? Uh, and we need to get going here because we're over time already. Okay, and there's our plus. Okay, so, um, so this is uh, running the S thing we just saw. So we say HERD7, we say model BPF, and uh, um, uh, BPF underbar LKMM.cat, excuse me. All right, that, if you don't do that, it, it just doesn't have any ordering whatsoever. And we're going to make it so that it defaults to the right thing. We don't know what the right thing is yet, so we pick it. Um, and then we give the file name S fence data litmus, and you hit enter, and it says never, like we saw before. Okay, and uh, well, that's kind of boring because 
Uh, so let's pick another one. And we have choices. All right. Uh, anyone want to uh, pick one for us? Well, I'm going to, I'll do uh, read and write. Okay, how about, how about store buffering? We'll do this one. Oops. Well, if I can make my fingers work, we will. All right. And that one says sometimes. Okay, so that can be misordered or reordered or whatever you want to call it. Great leading question. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's too small, I'm sorry. So here we've got a, uh, a store to X and then load from Y. On the other side, we store to Y and load from X. There's no synchronization whatsoever. There's no memory barriers, no ordering, whatever. So, yeah, that's, that's expected that, that it, it should say sometimes, and it does. Anyway, so uh, I hadn't, uh, I had not, uh, uh, early, early, Last week, Monday of last week, had you told me that I'd be showing a demo of this, I would have laughed at you. But here we are. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. And so again, uh, applause for, for uh, Perrin, Perrin Jay getting this going so quickly. All right. And I think uh, this is actually kind of pointless. I don't think I have much here, but whatever. So um, we're at, we're at uh, 5.30. I can stay and answer questions if people want to ask them. Uh, or we have the evening. Is that a uh, model that you just had, like that you feed into Herd7 in the kernel tree to play around with, or is that the plan, or? So uh, the plan is, uh, let me see if the plan is how are we distributing the model, essentially, right? Sorry? How are we gonna distribute the model itself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, my plan was to put it either in the tools memory ordering directory, uh, that may cause confusion because that's where we have main LKMM, in which case I would put it into documentation BPF standardization. Uh, right now it's just in, uh, the, the, one of the complication is right now it requires modifications to HERD7 tool itself. So you have to get a HERD7 from Perenjay's tree, build it, and so uh, I, I'm not in favor of putting it in the kernel tree until we have an official lease, release of uh, Heard seven that can be used because then we can. Otherwise, it's it's asking quite a bit of people. Go get this, build it, do this. You know, as opposed to use this version of this tool. But yes, the plan is to one way or another have the model itself in the Linux kernel source tree. If it's at all possible, it would help. I think to put it in the standardization directory. The only reason being that we already like tell people that's where the documents are going to okay. live. If you if it's not a problem and you can like link it from the other one, that would be no. Like it, it, it's. Uh, um, one of the, yeah, no, it, it should be fine. Basically what would happen is that you would set your directory to where the model itself is, and then you would run it and, get, and give the full path name of the file, and well, that's what we do for the Linux kernel and LKMM anyway, so that should be fine. Okay, I, I like that idea, so. Are these for litmus files or for the standard, for the written memory model? I might have misunderstood you. Uh, say, say again, I'm sorry? Is this for the written memory model or for the litmus? Like for the litmus? For files. the memory model itself. The litmus tests we'll put somewhere, okay, but okay. that's uh, maybe we put them in the same directory, maybe we don't. I don't know. You tell me. Yeah, I think, David, your suggestion is specifically if it's a RST file that has the uh, textual description meant for human readers that would go into what would be the IETF document. Okay. So that, that's what that directory is meant for. Uh, other than the index.rst, which is the only example of something that's like the index of the other files. Everything else should be an RST file from which uh, an IETF document gets derived. So, okay, so if let it's me, something let other me, uh, than, than the RST meant for the actual RFC, then it should go someplace else. But I agree that if that, that's the intent, then put it there. Okay, that, so, that's why so, like abi.rst is right there right now. So we don't have an internet draft right now, but it is, that's, that's the placeholder. That, that we okay, so, so this, these would be actually code files containing funny mm -hmm. code. Uh, should we put them in a subdirectory there, or should we put them somewhere else I, entirely? I, th I think it's fine if you want to do plain text. I think we can figure it out. Uh, we can have like a translation. Yeah. In, in any case, there will be an RST derived from whatever model we do that describes the 
the model. B basically, like the language and that we're going to put standardize. in. standardize. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Yeah, the, the language that we're going to put into the standard, if it's going to be, if that's what we're writing, it should go into the standardization subdirectory if possible. Okay. In whatever form is convenient for you. Okay. okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, right, right now we don't have a full thing yet, but we'll, I can, I'm, I'm happy to put it wherever it goes. Thanks so much, yeah. Okay, now I'm going to embarrass myself because this is too complicated it, so for not? me. But so you should not run BPF instructions through an optimizing compiler. You should not do that, right? That, that's okay. uh, that's my belief. But is that not what the integrated assembler in LLVM precisely do, do or does? I mean, well, I mean, so LLVM has an integrated assembler, right? So. It translates the assembler, parses it, understands it, translates it into IR, then it optimizes it. So if the assembler that you put in the integrated assembler, if it has a conditional branch followed by a store, which was it like that, right? Does Clank knows how does it know that it has to insert if in case an optimization moves the instructions around, how it knows that it has to insert a memory barrier there or not? How is it handled? It should be handled somehow in well, other LVM, LVM won't insert like anything and it won't optimize it in most of the cases as far as I know. And <clears throat> everywhere we use in line awesome, we use awesome volatile, so nothing get optimized. Oh, so, so it's in, not in Clank, issue if you use right now. volatile, it doesn't optimize what it's just a black box like in GCC. Ah, okay. Well it understands it, but it's not Yeah. Doing okay, okay. Then one way to look at this is, is the same as PowerPC or ARM assembly. If you were to do uh, optim those, if if you have an optimizer that doesn't mess up PowerPC or ARM assembly with control, do the control dependencies, it'll be fine with BPF as well. Like in yeah, yeah. Clang does weird shit <laughs> with awesome. Like when it's not volatile and it's yeah, you just like can remove things where it shouldn't. So it's I, like not a yeah. Well, it, maybe it's like this is how we coded it in the BPF backend and LVM that we like screwed up something in terms of like translation back and forth. But like we've hit, I well, personally like hit issues with the way it's not supposed to like it just like misoptimizes stuff. Not even like talking about like memory model, it's just like doing stuff that it shouldn't. So like custom volatile is recommendation. 